Patrick Childers on Brick House. My wife Rebecca and I are getting this boat ready to make a passage 1,100 miles that way, southwest, to the Coral Atoll of Chagos, deep in the Indian Ocean. Right now we're off of the east coast of Sri Lanka. And my job today is to go over the side, clean the bottom, check the prop and shaft, uh, check the anchor chain, and get everything ready to go. My big concern is we've been anchored in the same spot for almost two months. So it'll be a good experiment. Uh, we have, we hauled out four months ago and we put Jotun Seaforce 90 on the hull. That's made in Southeast Asia. It was the best, most expensive paint that we could get. We'll see how that's holding up. Prop speed, that's another experiment. Um, we put that on when we, this, this last time that we hauled out in Malaysia before we left there, that was a, almost a 1500 mile passage to here, but we sat in a marina for almost two weeks. Normally I'd go over the side and bag the prop with a black plastic bag, but we we're gonna be there for such a short time and I didn't wanna get another sinus infection from marina water, so I let it go. When we got here weeks later, I did see a couple tiny barnacles on the prop, on the uh, prop speed, and uh, a little bit of marine growth that I was easily able to wipe away with a soft rag. But now this will be a much bigger experiment sitting for two months in the same place. Prop speed, it isn't an anti-fouling. It's a silicone finish, so it's very slippery, makes it hard for marine growth to attach. But it isn't something that leaves a boat owner of all the work. It just helps to reduce the amount of work that you have to put into keeping the prop clean. The chain, I'm really concerned about that because there's no anti-fouling properties there and that'll be a good base comparison for everything else. Uh, what I'll be using today is the hookah. This is a sea breathe unit made in Canada. We've had it on the boat for eight years now and it's set up so I'm just going to be using one hose today in a minute. I'll get the camera and give you some close-ups but you can hook up two hoses for two divers it runs off of our 12 volt battery bank or we could take just like maybe the start battery out of the boat and put it in a dinghy and go out diving somewhere but i really normally use this and this is invaluable for just working on the bottom of the boat changing zinc's cleaning things so even though this is a very convenient hooker to be using you should really be taking scuba lessons you know go out and get a uh, open water certificate so if you're just starting out sailing that's the best way to go um, you'll really enjoy the underwater life then you'll know the equipment whether it's a hookah or a scuba tank that you're using and uh, you can rent tanks in a lot of places of the, wor of the world so it opens up just a whole new frontier for cruisers we have a scuba tank on board I rarely use it for recreational diving. I do keep it as an emergency um, piece of equipment. And a good example of that is in the Raja Ampat area of Indonesia where you're anchoring in 60 to 80, 100 feet every day. Three times a week I had to dig out that scuba tank and go down and free up the chain. There's no way in the world it was going to come up by itself. So that scuba tank has paid for itself many times over. In a lot of places, it isn't that difficult getting the tank filled. Even here in out of the way Sri Lanka, um, Trincomalee, they have scuba operations here. I'll be in the water by myself. Some viewer might say, oh, Patrick's in the water using compressed air. He needs to dive with a buddy, uh, have somebody on deck watching every minute. But when you think about it, people drive cars through terrible rainstorms by themselves. People fly airplanes by themselves. People sail around the world by themselves and I feel pretty comfortable diving around the boat and doing what I need to do all by myself. So it's not that big of a deal, but if you feel more comfortable diving with a buddy and having somebody on watch uh, when you're in the water, do it. That's the best. You don't want to do anything that uh, pushes your own comfort uh, limits. I'll get the little camera and I'll give you some close-ups here. A clock so I can tell how much time I spent on this project today. This red plug would normally go in here for the stowed position. We have an air filter in here now. A second diver would have an air filter here with their hose coming off of this side. I have two 20-foot hoses set up here, so I'll have plenty of maneuvering around this 40-foot sailboat. This gray bladder fills with air. It's very large and very hard, and that helps to keep a constant pressure down to the diver no matter what depth he's at. And this is something of a free flow system. 
whatever air the diver doesn't use, any extra air will go through an overpressure valve on the back side of his regulator assembly. And also, if anything ever went wrong with the compressor, if uh, ran out of electricity, somebody shut it off prematurely, there would be a residual amount of air, actually quite a bit of air, left in the, uh, the bladder so that the diver would know that, uh, hey, it's time to come up to the surface. Cause tools to use underwater have to have gloves. Any little coral cut or barnacle slice, it has to be washed out and cleaned and disinfected immediately. There's so many bad microbes in seawater, and especially here in the tropics, the slightest little cut can get viciously infected very quickly. So we carry a lot of Bacteroban, which is a prescription, and also triple antibiotic, Neosporin, which you can buy over the counter, and uh, in a big array of um, antibiotic pills. Don't take any chances with small infections here in the tropics. It's not worth the gamble. Um, a painter is four and one. Sometimes it's called a six and one, eight and one. It all depends on how many things you can think up and how many uses uses you can think up for the uh, tool. This little pointy end is good for getting into crevices, flat area for scraping, another flat area for scraping or opening paint cans. Uh, the rounded area was originally designed for squeegeeing down paint rollers while you're washing them out in a sink, but on a boat that's really good on prop shafts and anchor chains. It's stainless steel, buy them at any paint store. A little scrubby for the water line, stainless steel wire brush gets used all over the boat once you're in down below cleaning. A little screwdriver for getting in the paddle wheel of the knot meter. Marine Growth always gets up in there and tries to keep that thing from uh, reading properly. This is actually a, um, a, a wax applicator for large flat areas. It's a sponge, but I'll have a rag over the top of it for wiping down the anti-fouling areas. If that doesn't work so well, I'll take it off and I'll just use the sponge by itself. It seems a little coarser than the soft cloth. And if that doesn't work, then I'll have to go get my real big scrubby handle with other scrubbies to put on it. Uh, but this paint's only four months old. I really don't expect too much trouble with it. Before we go in the water, you know, growing up in Miami, we always just spit in our mask, wash it out a little bit, and away you go to help keep it from fogging up. It never really worked that well. But another cruiser said, rather than buying anything at the uh, dive shop, you can just use conditioning shampoo, a little bit on the tip of your finger, wipe it around in the mask, rinse it out, and you're good to go. It's amazing how well conditioning shampoo will keep fog out of your mask. Another thing that's required is a t-shirt. I mean, this water is 84 degrees, so it's very comfortable, certainly not wetsuit weather, but the t-shirt is to keep all that zoop, <laughs> all the little shrimps and other zooplankton from jumping on you. I've been in the water in some areas where I'd come out looking like a carpet of shrimps and uh, they're itchy and they get under your, your arms and in, in your belly button, all kinds of places. And so uh, it's best to wear a t-shirt. Also, the, there used to be jellyfish in these waters here uh, about two, three weeks ago. Fortunately, they've disappeared. But once you do come out of the water, you really need to rinse the t-shirt out very well. Otherwise, you just throw it on the deck. It's gonna end up smelling like an old fish real quick. Um, the boarding ladder on our way down to make the electrical hookups. I'll throw this over the side. The boarding ladder has seven rungs, 12 inches apart. So even out in the middle of an ocean, if it's rough and stormy, somebody falls over the side, it isn't that terribly difficult then for them to get back onto the boat. I'll have the uh, Honda generator running to keep the batteries charged up. We're just a little low this morning. We keep the sea breeze stored down here. The blue box goes down in that area. The, uh, the blue bag of hoses and the bladder goes over here and then all of this stuff piles right on top of it. So it's really out of the way. It's really uh, no problem keeping the sea breeze on the boat. We'll go down and make the electrical hookups to get things going here. In the battery bank, we have six Trojan T105. They're uh, six volt batteries, all set up to put out 12 volts. And we'll put on the red connection first. 
and put that right directly to the battery. Make sure it's a good solid contact. And the negative. Negative goes on last, and it's also the first one to come off. And a good solid contact. Okay, we are good to go. <laughs> that was a lot of work. I never expected the anchor chain to be that bad. I was down for right at about two hours. I need to catch my breath. But what a learning experience it was for me today. I'm not impressed with that Jota 90. It's a kind of a hard paint. And I think maybe next time I might have to use a, a real scrubby on it. Obviously the, uh, the soft cloth didn't work well. The sponge worked much better by itself. But I was surprised at how much growth that, that was there. I mean, this is supposed to be anti-fouling paint with copper in it. And it's not anti-fouling too much. What was a big surprise though was the uh, prop speed how little growth was on there. There's just a tiny barnacle or two and uh, hardly anything else to wipe away with the rags. You know, up in some of the crevices, I had to use the painter's tool, the foreign one, to uh, get some marine growth out of the little crevices and on some of the areas where uh, nothing was treated. So uh, I'm very impressed with the prop speed. I'd like to do the whole boat in prop speed. Uh, but this has only been four months. So we've got a long ways to go and we'll see how well it holds up. But that anchor chain, what a disaster that was. I mean, that was a ton of work. It's 25 feet deep here, and it was the same way from top to bottom. Oh, the um, hook, the anchor the chain hook, that's a mantis hook. 
very nice hook. Um, I've had too many times with the old regular hook that you put on a chain, jumping off in bad currents and when shifting winds and everything. So I got this Mantis and it stays put. It's a, it, that was a good, uh, good piece of equipment to pick up. Well, today was a big learning experience for me. I don't like the Joe 1090. I like the prop speed. I like the Mantis uh, chain hook. And uh, you know, you sit in an anchorage too long, look what happens. <laughs> good reason to keep on moving. But we've been here for two months in Sri Lanka, had a great time. See, saw a lot of elephants, a lot of other good sites. I'll leave those videos for other people to do. And uh, we'll just concentrate on how to keep the darn boat moving and in one piece and uh, well maintained. Well, I hope you liked the video. Has it helped to you? Please push the button down there for the thumbs up. And off to the side is the round picture of Brick House. If you can click on that and subscribe, it'd be much appreciated. Thanks for, for thanks a lot for watching. And we'll see you soon.